In this episode, we travel to a mine outside of Nova Scotia, visiting a phenomenal site found in the province of Newfoundland. To be more specific, we're heading to very near to St. John's, the capital city of Newfoundland, to an island found in Conception Bay called Bell Island. For those of you who haven't seen the previous episode, we recommend you go to episode number 42 for the Bell Island Primer. So if you've not already seen it, we recommend it because we're not covering any of that material here. It's completely up to you. So continuing on in our Bell Island series, in this episode, we're gonna go on to the next abandoned mine. Now the number two mine isn't actually abandoned per se, as, as an active mine, of course, it is, uh, it is finished, done, closed and abandoned. But this one happens to have a museum sitting at the entrance, meaning that they dug up the number two slope and they built a museum and a connector to actually take you down into the workings of the number two mine, at least as far down as they can go before it gets flooded. They've installed ventilation, electrical, lighting, and so on, so the general public can come visit this mine, including yourselves. So this episode will be slightly different than our regular format, as we won't be going into derelict mine workings with flashlights in the dark. Since this is a significant mine in the Bell Island system, we didn't want to gloss over it, and we thought we'd take an episode to give an overview and show you what it all looks like. So of course we did do the tour while we were there, and since it is a formal, scripted, repeated tour, we don't want to show too much of it and give it all away. The last thing we want to do is make this episode into a giant spoiler. But it is important to show and highlight this mine in context of the others, as the last episode was the number 5 mine, and the next episode after this one will be the abandoned number 1 mine. Showing you the number 2 and parts of the tour as it is presented will give you an idea to compare and contrast. So the museum itself sits kind of in the middle of town, amongst some large waste rock piles. And like I said, it sits right atop the slope, going down into the number two mine. There is a small museum there with all of the artifacts and old photography and so on, as well as several mine guides. And these guides will take you on the tour, down the slope, and through the sections that they do take the public through. Our tour guide happened to be the infamous Ed, who has been doing these tours for a very, very, very long time. Wonderful tour guide, extremely knowledgeable, worked in the mines when he was young, and an absolute gentleman. Now, like I said, we'll interject little snippets here of Ed and the tour, but we're not going to show you everything, quite the opposite. We'll just show you snippets as required. The main thing is that we want to show you inside the number two and let you see it in contrast to what you just saw last episode in the old decrepit number five mine. So first things first, the formal tour starts with some briefing. Everyone gets helmets. Sometimes you get a little poncho or a jacket to put on if you fear getting cold or damp. And they feature a little model of the immediate area where the tour goes, showing the room and pillar mining of that exact zone, which is only, of course, a small snippet of the underground workings here at the number two. And of course, only a teeny weeny bit of the entire mine itself that goes out under Conception Bay. So let's let Ed take it away and give us a briefing about what we're about to get into. But after about five years, the upper bed started to peter out. Number one mine just down to the east of it, and number five mine up west of it closed at that time. But numbers two, three, four, and six mines were mining the middle and lower beds of ore. And they discovered they went under the ground and indeed underneath Conception Bay. So they put away their pickaxes and they started to drill and blast their way underground. Our tour today will take us down to number two mine. We're going to travel down this wide area called the main slope. Along the way, we'll stop and I'll tell you about the different types of lighting used in the mines back in those days. And when we get down to this area, we'll go into what's known as the burn area. We'll come out of the burn, we'll go to our lowest level today, it'll be level 23, and we'll come back up into this area where we have a little display set up. Now, after the briefing, we head through a door at the back of the room and head through a bit of uh, conduit tubing that takes us out the rear basement of the building and right into the top of the slope to the number two mine. Now, of course, as you head down, you immediately notice this has been developed for the public. It's been cleaned up. It's all electrically lit. The floor has been graveled. So it's about as user friendly as an old abandoned mine could be. The first thing we noticed once we got into the tour and underground is that the number two mine is of a very much larger scale than the number five was. The ceiling or the back of the mine is approximately 17 feet above your head, where back in the number five you could see we could basically reach up above our head and touch the ceiling, no problem. This is of course is because the band of iron ore over in this area was much, much thicker. 
thus the height of the number two mine is exactly the height of the iron ore itself. Now this ore, as you can see it in the walls, is a beautiful 50 to 55% purity. This is what made the Bell Island mines so extensive and so lucrative back in the day. As Ed takes you down the slope, he does a few little stops here and there to do some back history and point out some things along the wall. Actually, let's just take a moment here to let Ed do a segment, and this will provide you an example of what one of the stops is like. Ah, uh, folks, time flies when you're having fun. It's 1912 now, and we're not going to use that sea oil anymore. Now we're going to use this lamp. Now, this is a carbide lamp. This lamp is in two pieces. You unscrew the bottom half and you'd fill it with a white calcium carbide powder. And the top half you'd fill with water. On the top of the lamp there's a valve the miner would open to allow the drips of water into the carbide. And once the water and the carbide mixed, that would release an acetylene gas which would be under pressure and which would come out through the center of the lamp. And on this particular lamp at about the five o'clock position would be a wheel and flint assembly. The miner would give this a flick to ignite this acetylene gas. Just stop and think for a second, folks. He's going to take this lamp and he's going to tie it off on that soft hat that he's wearing. And when he ignites that acetylene gas, that's going to produce a flame some four to six inches out in front of this hat. It'd be like having a blowtorch on your head. You could be very careful lightning around your friend. Anyone that had long hair, beard, loose clothing, you could easily set them on fire. Now they used this lamp from 1912 right on up through to 1935 when they came with the electric lamp with the 10 hour battery pack that I'm wearing today. But at that time, most miners would still have preferred to use the carbide lamp as they felt it was brighter. So from 1912 to 1935, we'll move on. Now to fast forward a little bit, eventually the tour does get to the point where we reach water, which means you can't go any further, of course. And if you remember back to the primer episode, all of the undersea mining is flooded. Thus, the tour can only take you down so deep before you actually reach the water. So he does explain this and points it out, and this is what that stop sounds like. Well, folks, we're going to move down to level 23. It's the deepest, darkest part of the mine for us today. And as you can see, it is pretty dark down here. And you never know what you're going to see in the mine. But don't worry, folks, I got a rock. <laughs> now, then, folks, there are 247 levels in number two mine. This is level 23, and this is as far as our adventure takes us today. And the reason for that, yeah. the water. We're flooded up to this point. As you remember, from our ceiling or our back wall, which is just right here, to our floor or our front wall is 17 feet. So what you have here is a 17 foot tube of water that runs some two and a half miles. But you recall, all of our back slopes are also 17 feet. They also run two and a half miles. They are also flooded. So what you have here is approximately two and a half billion gallons of fresh water. There's no seawater in our mine. This water from natural runoff from the surface, from spring wells that run covered during the operation of the mine. While these mines were in operation, they always had to be pumped. And when they closed these mines in 1966, they also shut down the pumps. And three years later, the water is here. This is how high up the water comes. From here, it filters out to the cliffs and drips into the ocean. So we'll stop there as far as Ed and giving away any further spoilers of the tour. There's way more than this. You're underground on the tour approximately a half hour to 40 minutes. So we'll just leave it at that. Now there are some little bits of trivia that I do want to make you aware of. These are brought up during the tour. There may be some of you who are familiar with an old movie franchise from the 80s and 90s, science fiction, called The Screamers. Well, one of the sequels from that franchise was called Screamers the Hunting. Well, if you've seen that movie, you've seen the Bell Island Number 2 mine, because all of the underplanet, cave-like scenes that they shot for that movie were all shot here on Bell Island in the Number 2 mine. And here, I'll just continue with some clips to let you see that. Alliance Center received an SOS from this planet. We were sent to investigate, render assistance to any survivors, bring them back home to Earth. 
Do you know of any military depots where we can find fuel cells? Never heard of any in these parts. Don't worry. We'll find you what you need. Do you know someplace specific? One. But it's too dangerous now. And another thing I should bring up while we're on the number two mine is that they're starting to get into in recent years, mine diving here. And yes, I mean diving, scuba diving, underwater. In fact, there's already been some teams that have gone down and sort of did the initial dives ever, and their videos can be found on YouTube. Just over a pillar set from where the mine tour happens, there is a sort of dive platform where they go under and head down the slope and into very deep areas some of which they actually mapped and posted on the internet. I'll show that map here now. And they got pretty damn far. I mean, not in the grand scheme of the entire mine, because the mine is so huge, but just having walked the number five in open air, I can only imagine being sort of by yourself with a tank on your back and a flashlight, going through these flooded sections, pitch darkness, confined, cold, and nowhere to surface. I can only imagine there's a very significant risk to this kind of diving, but I guess for those who do shipwrecks and go down and in the hulls of old ships below the surface of the ocean, maybe this isn't so scary for those people at all. I would assume that mine diving does carry significantly higher risks than undersea diving, but I could be wrong, I'm not a diver. So that's about it for the museum. Now, before we exit the episode, I do want to bring up the number four mine, since there's really nowhere else to put it. I'll put it in this episode. The number four mine does have a slope that comes up, and it just ends out in the middle of this big field. And the collar of that slope still sits there to this day. And it used to just sit open. There are old pictures from recent years. Now, I was told it doesn't go down into the slope. There was sort of a, a gate or a grate, maybe 50 or 100 feet in. So you couldn't get down into the mine. But they did leave the collar there in open air in the middle of the field. But in recent years, they capped it over with this wall and door. And now what they provide is an actual theater experience underground where they put on a play to a live audience in an underground theater. They call it Theater of the Mine. Now, it didn't seem to be running the day that we were there, but we did stop by to see it and check out the location. And this is what it all looked like. So that's it for the number two mine and a little bit of the number four. Uh, next episode, we're going to save kind of what I consider the best for last, the old number one mine. Back to a true long lost abandoned mine over under the north edge of the town. This one, folks, is rarely visited, and not many people know about it. It's not like the number five. So that'll be the fourth and last episode in this Bell Island series. So we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.